I really want to acknowledge that this is different. I mean, this space is different. I'm literally talking to you from a desk in my bedroom because I've had to give up my office and give up all my space <laughs> to my kids who are learning from home, college kids like you. And I'm literally talking to most of you probably in your personal spaces. And I think that we need to acknowledge that. So I want to think of this as an invitation. Um, and because you're in my home virtually, I mean, it's staged very nicely because I have to teach here, but if I turned it, then you would see my laundry. Um, so you're in my home and, and you're my invited guest and hopefully I'm your invited guest and vice versa. So I am going to attempt to now screen share. I'm going to, I have a small, not a small, but a, a um, yeah, I have, I have a PowerPoint. It's kind of disconcerting on your PowerPoint settings. Um, if we can screen share, because what's happening is I can only see, okay, I can see you down here, the PowerPoint. So it's hard. I'm going to try to keep you all in, in my view, but if I start talking too fast, Lynn, interrupt or somebody raise their hand because I don't know what's going on in the settings, if it's kind of interfacing with the Zoom settings that we have um, at my institution. So are we on screen share? Can you see my, can I, can I? You should, you should be able to screen share. I, um, okay. I all right, can everybody see Dr. Benson Smith's screen? No, all right. No, okay, let's see here. Uh, do, 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 show taskbar. I'm gonna come back down here. And I think what's happening is um, I need to be on this screen here. Okay, so share screen. I just see it. And here we are. I'm getting a countdown. Oh, no, not a countdown. Share screen. Okay, share. Can you all see it? Yes? Oh, uh, there we go. Are yeah. you in front of this screen? Okay. Great. Okay, I'm going to move you awesome. over here. Okay. All right. Yeah, this is what Excellent. I'm trying. Sorry. I'm trying to figure out. So now you all just see yourselves. Um, how to minimize. I see, I see you and I see the, I see the PowerPoint. Okay. Oh, okay. So I see y'all. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So that's working. So, um, I would like to just begin with a breath in a moment. Um, as an African American, as a woman, as a parent, as a daughter, as a sister, a wife, um, a friend, I would be remiss and I would be very dishonest with respect to my own privilege because I sit here in a nice home. I am safe. My kids are safe. All my loved ones are safe and healthy, which again, for a person who intersects in the communities that I live in, this is no small thing, um, especially now during a pandemic, especially during political uprisings as we've been witnessing across the country. Um, so I'm asking that we take a moment of silence and we think about those who are suffering, those who are dying, those who have died. Those who have lost people, who have lost themselves, those who have lost their jobs, their health, their homes. I want us to take a moment of silence and a breath for those who are or have been displaced from their families and their communities, those who have been traumatized or in being traumatized and who have no support or framework to make sense of their trauma and no one to help them in, as the spiritual says, uh, bear their burdens and take a moment of silence and really think about where you are. Um, and to use the African-American vernacular English, how you be um, now, were, and where you'd like to be soon. So if we just take a minute and then take a breath. I've been doing that 
of late with my students um, because I find that I teach across two institutions and um, this is hard and it's, 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 it's unsettling. And um, I think that in we, our push to try to make things normal, um, we forget to give credence to just how much work that we're doing um, to just maintain. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to acknowledge where I'm sitting. I'm teaching online and I'm teaching from my home in Rancho Cucamonga, California. And this sits on ancestral lands of the Cucamonga people. Um, and the Cucamonga people are members of the Gabrielino Tongva tribe, um, whose territory spanned the entire Southern California area. So the Los Angeles Basin, all the way out to the Channel Islands, which is closer to um, Oregon. Um, and the Gabrielino Tonga people are one of the largest tribes in the United States that are still fighting for recognition and restitution from the US government. And I feel like as an African American woman in particular, um, whose ancestors and comes from an ancestral history of having work, bodies, and time exploited, that it's incumbent upon me to recognize um, where I sit and why I sit here um, all the way through from who I am now and my lineage to the lineage of the folks and, and the peoples who, who helped pave the way for us to be here. So what I want to talk about today. So I don't know, and I can't see hands, so you're going to, now I lost you all again visually. Let me see if I can get you back. Oh, I got you back. How many of y'all knew about the scholar strike? You can just kind of do whatever that thing you can do on Zoom where you can show hands. Um, so there was a scholar strike. It's like, wait, I, I could have not gone to class. What is going on? Um, there was a scholar strike um, that was, September 8th and 9th of this week. And so it wasn't a traditional strike or anything like that, where everyone stopped working and uh, professors in particular or students went to administration or administrative um, offices and demanded some sort of economic restitution or something um, to happen different with an economic goal. Um, the start scholar strike rather was conceived by this person. Um, she's Dr. Anthea Butler. And she is a professor or associate professor of religious studies in the graduate chair in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She's not so far from you all. Um, Dr. Butler is an author of numerous books, including uh, Women in the Church of God and Christ, Making a Sanctified Call. Um, and the scholar strike was inspired for her. She um, conceived of this um, scholar strike as a way to unite um, academics and what could go on possibly within academic centers with what was happening in the WNBA and the NBA and with Colin Kaepernick and other athletes. So she was she called this to underscore the urgent importance of addressing racism and injustice in the United States. Some people, I mean the strike, like I said, wasn't a strike where some people chose to uh, refrain from their usual and their daily activities. It was a time for, particularly for scholars of color, um, for healing, for reflection. Um, some people chose to use that time to teach and to, um, you know, have a teach-in and talk about systemic racism and particularly talk about police violence um, within their communities and, and throughout the United States. I chose that time because I generally teach about systemic racism and I'm teaching about feminism and right now I'm teaching about methods and decolonizing methods. I chose to use that time with my class to think about how we could re-envision and how I could re-envision what I'm doing and even my teaching style, um, which a lot of that is now in this talk today because my graduate students really, I thought I was like woke. Well, I didn't think I was woke, but I thought I was like doing a good job. And they're like, mm, you could do a little bit better. So I'm going to try to do a little bit better for you all today. And, and I'm looking forward to some of your feedback. Um, 
So while this focus, the focus of the scholar strike was on solidarity and raising awareness of systemic racism, particularly within policing, I chose this, and I think this is opportunity in general for us in the academy to focus on broader inequities and in institutionalized racism, sexism, heteronormativity, and classism within higher education and academia. I, to be honest with you, approached when I first saw this and I first saw we're going to focus on policing, I, um, and I got numerous invitations from my administration to say something about policing, to say something. I, I actually, I'm going to be just honest, I was irritated. And I was irritated because I felt like we were marginalizing something that needed to be central to what we should be doing um, within the academy. I mean, we can't, especially those of us in academic universities, bring awareness to systemic racism and its causes without looking particularly at the academy and looking at systemic racism, looking at our disciplines, and my discipline is included, the role of our disciplines, the role of how we do truth verification, the role of all of this in perpetuating systemic racism, supporting systemic racism, sexism, and heteronormativity, and actually reifying it and, and, and really institutionalizing it. So really what I want us to do today is to think about this, and to think about 2020 as a sort of wake up call, to think about what's going on right now. I mean, we are in the Greek terms, an apocalypse. This is, a, you know, this is the breakdown and the revelation of what was that is no longer working so that we have something that can become. And so as we are in the midst of an institutional breakdown that quite frankly, in my opinion, and for what I study and what Dr. Eckert, I think you had an article <laughs> that I study, we have been, this has been a long time coming. Then we have been pushing towards this moment. I mean, I'm living in California right now, and I don't know if y'all saw the news, but the sky is glowing. Um, and around me right now, I am surrounded by mountains. And so the San Gabriel Mountains, I have um, a large mountain peak called Mount Baldy. All the mountains are on fire right now. And so we are living in the middle of cataclysmic climate change. We are living in the middle of a pandemic, and we are living in the middle of economic and social upheaval. And what I want us to do is actually embrace those challenges. Embrace the chaos and the challenges that are presented by the coronavirus and the protests against systemic oppression and the deep fissures that our institutional inequities have been, that these events have brought to the surface. Um, I have a, one of my best friends, I have a best friend who is in political science, but I also have a best friend who is a philosopher. And, and while that might sound objectifying, one of my best friends is a philosopher. It's not quite like saying one of my best friends is Black, but she's also Black. Um, she's also a Spinoza scholar. And we were talking and she was telling me about Spinoza's idea of, of systems and bodies. And what she said was that in philosophy, in Spinoza's philosophy, political sp systems, uh, which in our case is political scientists, would translate to mean institutions. And all systems are interconnected and they coexist in relationship to one another. And so she, she suggested that what we are experiencing right now is a breakdown of the body politic, literally the breakdown of the body and the system. And us, for us as political scientists, that would mean the political institutions that comprise this body politic. And she says that this is largely caused by the exploitation and lack of care that we have given to other bodies. This is Spinoza's philosophy. If you don't care for all the bodies within the system, if one body starts to break, then all the other bodies will begin to break down. And so for you all as political scientists, you need to think about, and I invite you to think about, our institutions as part of our ecosystem and where those breakdowns, and the breakdowns in the particular institutions, healthcare, um, our political institutions, voting, all of these, what are these breakdowns and what are these fissures really revealing? As professors, we incorporate these discussions and critiques of other institutions and we don't highlight 
what is real about our own institution. But we continue to do research and conduct our business of scholarship, me included, um, without challenging the foundations and histories and epistemologies. Epistemologies, and I promise that's probably one of only two of my theory words that I'll use today, it's just a fancy way of saying ways of knowing, ways of structurally, structuring knowledge and verifying truth. So what I'm saying is in the academy, in our classrooms, and particularly for you all as young folk who will inherit whatever we're going to create from this, this is the time to really challenge our foundational epistemologies, our foundational ways of knowing, our foundational ways of structuring, and our foundational ways of verifying truth and truth claims. And to incorporate more interdisciplinary forms of praxis and research and more relational forms. The academy is extremely siloed. If you are a political scientist, you do not study what sociologists study. You might poke at it, but you don't study it. We have siloed ourselves until even knowledge right now is not relational. And so what part of the challenge of this moment to me is to make what is and what has been separated and segregated, connected and relational. We must further become unmoored from the practices and habits and structures that brought us to this moment. I love the term unmoored. It's one of my favorites. It's a juicy word, as my 10-year-old would say. To become unmoored is to release yourself from the status and the structures. It is to let go. And we need to deconstruct institutional inequities and deliberately decenter whiteness and focus on our privileges. That's why I started. I have privileges. I'm a black woman. I'm in the academy. That gives me a lot of privilege. Y'all are here. What? Saturday morning in your bedrooms and you're sitting here and you're looking at me and you're talking and waiting for me to tell you what I think. It is an incredible privilege to do that and to recognize that privilege and to ask yourselves, what are you going to do with it? Where are you going to place it? Who are you going to connect with? And how are you going to use this to build bridges where bridges don't currently exist? So this is, to me, what the call of the scholar strike was. This was a moment to revisit and to revisit my roots and to revisit how I practice my craft. I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about African-American vernacular. And I am gonna tell you, I'm gonna jump in and out of the vernacular because I believe that part of the recentering that needs to happen is we really need to recenter forms of speech, speech patterns. So African-American vernacular, which is most disparagingly called Ebonics, um, is a pattern of speech that like all other dialects and you know i would say right now particularly if you're here you have at least two dialects i have at least four or five dialects i understand prestige english so i can speak and i can speak with the quote unquote king's english or american vernacular dialect and represent many institutions i have african-american vernacular English. So I can speak with that. I speak it very well. I speak the language of my disciplines, S, plural, political science. I speak statistics. I like to condescend with statistics a lot, particularly if someone is being like a doctor. And I also speak the language of feminist epistemologies um, and some other dialects. So what I want you to think about is the ways in which certain patterns of speech, certain dialects have been centered. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to slip in and out of dialectical patterns. So as we move forward, one thing that I want to talk about is who you be. Who are you in this moment? And who are your people? How do you locate your people? Because I'm going to, part of showing the picture of Dr. Butler 
And part of what we're going to, I'm going to um, give homage to some women and young girls who died at the hands of police is to locate for you and to show you who my people are, how I locate myself and how I situate myself, not only in this moment, but how I will locate and situate myself moving forward. So, this is, do I, you, mm, is it 30 minutes already? So it's an hour, so we won't watch um, the video and I can send it um, on a link if you'd like, um, Dr. Eckert, but. Yes, yeah, send the video. Um, so I don't know how familiar you all are with the Say Her Name project, but the Say Her Name project was conceived of um, by a group of scholars, Beth Ritchie, um, Kimberly Crenshaw being the most prominent of, of the scholars um, and activists to recenter and not to, to decenter, but also recenter and focus and give homage to and show who our people are again um, amongst women, but particularly um, Black women who have died at the hands of police. Um, even now, as we're in this moment, the face of police violence, and this is again not to, to say not rightfully so, is really centered on the violence that is happening with and between um, African American men. So police violence and police brutality and, Afri and Black men dying at the hands of police. And Black men die at a disproportionate number to any other population at the hands of police. Say Her Name really wanted us to understand that Black women also are dying and the ways in which Black women are dying at the hands of the police. All of these women pictured and this, this dear little child who's pictured died um, from police encounters in their own home. And I shouldn't even say police encounters, it was police invasions in their own home. No knock warrants. Um, so Ayanna Stanley Jones was in her own home in Detroit. Police barged into her home in a no knock warrant and barraged her family, barraged her home with bullets. She was shot. Um, Katherine Johnson in 2006 also was killed in her own home at 92 years old. Um, Alberta Sproul was killed not from gunfire, but also from a misplaced, is what they said, warrant. Um, no knock warrant in her home. The police um, tear gas and they kind of they firebombed the home and she died as cardiac result, a uh, cardiac arrest as a result of that. Um, and a Tatiana Jefferson died while attending to her six-year-old nephew. She spent the entire evening um, playing with him and babysitting him for her sister when she saw what she believed to be an intruder um, walking past her window. She grabbed her licensed firearm and pulled back the curtain to the window. The police officer saw the firearm and he shot into her home and killed her. Again, a no knock warrant on an address that was a mistake. And I believe that most people by now are familiar um, with what happened to Breonna Taylor um, in Louisville, Kentucky, also a victim of a no knock warrant. Um, it is to me really important to underscore the relationship between violence at the hands of the police and black bodies, but importantly, to also highlight and to call, and this is difficult for me, so I am sorry if I stumble, and to lift up these women. Because once you start to see this, and allow me to put on my political science hat for one second, we study systems, we study patterns as political scientists. We study it with statistics, we study it in a, new, in a number of ways. One of the powers of bringing in Black trans, Black women, and, and Black queer and bi folk into the conversation and what's going on in the Black community at large at the hands of the police is to highlight 
the systemic nature of this. This is, these are five women who died in five different places at different points in time based on systems and the way in which particularly styles of policing and systems of policing are operated within the black community. So I think it's very important to hold this and hold the women and hold them dear. These are not women who, and that, sorry for the rough transition, who have died at the hands of police. These are women who, when we talk about recentering and refocusing, what does it mean to recenter our scholarship? What does it mean to recenter the academy and how we study? And what does it mean to center Black women, Black scholars, Black theorists, and the Black experience? in our conversations and in our institutional reforms. These women are members of the Combahee River Collective. The Combahee River Collective in 1971 gathered together to think about just what I asked. What does it mean to be a Black woman, to be a lesbian at a time when great change was happening in the 70s? And what does it mean to have your scholarship, your experience, and your knowledge centered in the reformation and the reclamation at that time. So this is the Smith sisters. So this is Barbara Smith. This is Beverly Smith. Uh, this is, and this is another picture of Beverly Smith. I have an academic crush on Beverly Smith, so sorry. And this is Demeter Frazier. And so, like I said, in 1971, they formed the Combahee River Collective that started with this statement. We believe above all else, our politics initially sprang from the shared belief that black women are inherently valuable. That our liberation is a necessity, not as an adjunct to somebody else's. Maybe because of our need, or mainly because of our uh, need as human persons for autonomy. This may seem obvious and it may sound simplistic, but it is apparent that to no other ostensibly progressive movement has ever considered our specific oppression as a priority or worked seriously for the ending of that oppression. Merely naming the pejorative stereotypes attributed to black women, at that time, Mammy, Matriarch, Sapphire, or Bull Dagger, Welfare Queen, Jezebel, I would add these, nearly, merely naming these let alone cataloging the cruel and often murderous treatment we receive, indicates how little value has been placed upon our lives during the four centuries of bondage in the Western Hemisphere. So they're talking in 1971, we are talking in 2020, and we're asking the same question. This is, at the essence, folks, what Say Our Name is trying to do. They go on to say that we realize that the only people who care enough about us to work consistently for our liberation are us. Our politics evolve from a healthy love for ourselves, our sisters, and our community, which allows us to continue our struggle and our work. And I'll repeat, a healthy love for ourselves, our sisters, and our community. These are who our people are. This is who their people be. And this is who they be. So I want to just take a moment to pause and contemplate what it means to say that Black women are inherently valuable. Our value and our work and our time and our care is independent of any and should not need any statistical proof, any moral justification for the existence. We just are. One of my favorite pictures to come out of um, the current protest is this one and it is Darren Rencher and I know who Darren Rencher is, and I know who he represents. Um, this is, so the description is a, an attempt to have a full description for people who are, are, are sight impaired. But 
What he's saying is true. Black matter is the minimum. Black lives are worthy. Black lives are beloved. Black lives are needed. They're necessary. Black women's lives are necessary, needed, and beloved. That's why I started with, I am a sister. I am a mother. I am an auntie. I am a friend. Before I am all of those things that Professor Eckert read, that is not who I am. That is not who I be. Those are my accomplishments. That is the work. That is a compendium of words and lists of things that I've done. But that is not, in the vernacular of my community, who I be. I am her friend. I am my kid's mother. I am a wife. And I am necessary. And in that, complete. I'm going to stop because then I, I want to move to a, like a slightly more academic part, but I want to ask to see if there are any questions. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me just, I, I lost visual of everyone. Uh, so far, we don't have any on the chat. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So, yes, I can hear you. Um, so the, the CRC, as it's known, the Combahee River Collective, it's founded in this idea of resistance and disruption of African-American scholars. Go all the way back to that question. What does it mean to center Black women? What does it mean at the title of this talk to center Black women is not only scholarship, but language, our language of liberation. Our language of liberation is a language of resistance. So they center resistance. Our language of liberation is calling out and understanding and situating ourselves in a history of resistance. So within the CRC, which I would invite you all to read, it's very small. Um, they name Ida B. Wells, badass Ida B. Wells, man. Um, Mary Church Terrell, Fannie Lou Hamer, also badass women who were Ida B. Wells, at a time when there was no civil rights, no civil rights legislation, no voters' rights legislation, um, no like reliable transportation, and you had to wear these shitty dresses that kind of like, you know, went up to here and all the way down to your ankle, went about some of the most important data collection that is still foundational for how we understand what we're talking about right now. Violence white supremacy and violence at the hands of police. And she collected, I don't know if I can see her ways of hands, how many people know who Ida B. Wells is? Good. So she collected data and stories, narrative stories as a journalist at the time, but as a good journalist by herself, she went and she investigated lynchings. So when there was a lynching and when there was a report of a lynching. Her husband was back at the newspaper, like printing. I love this image, like Ida B. Wells. I also like the image of like Harriet Tubman, just as an aside, that Harriet Tubman was like liberating folks. And like, she was married and like her husband's home baking pies. That's like my, like, I know it's probably not true, but that's my visual image. And so both of these women, but Ida B. Wells went and she would collect narratives and she compiled the narratives and she would write it, send it back home to her husband. He would publish it in the newspaper. And what we get is compendiums of data. For methodologists like me, this is data. It's narrative reports and narrative accounts. And what she starts to see in these narrative reports and narrative accounts is exactly what I was talking about earlier, a pattern that all the lynchings, independent of where they were and whether or not they, and unconnected, had a certain pattern. And what she starts to argue is that this pattern is not about the individuated acts of what the Black men at this time were accused of doing. These are patterns that are indicative of white supremacy and white control within the community, and they are recognizable. If she were doing this today, she would throw it into Qualtrics, and you would see, whoom, 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 here we are. And then you would go, OK, this is robust. And so this woman was doing this at a time before women 
black people had any situated rights, any of the rights that we enjoy today. And so the reason why the CRC invokes, there's a reason why I talk about Ida B. Wells, is so we understand not only my lineage, who my people are, and locate myself within an academic community, but we also start to understand the histories and the systems that this is not new. This is repeatable. If it has been repeated, then it can be disrupted. The CRC also talks about solidarity. And the last one is healing and healing justice. And, and I really, I mean, I'm going to finish in a minute. I want everyone, as we kind of move in this moment and we move within these systems and we're moving between moments of despair and hope to remember that healing is important. And they end this with healing, which is wonderful. And they talk about, the need for healing between sisters, the healing between communities, the healing of bodies, going back to what my friend was saying about institutional breakdown and bodies in disrepair, bodies in disrepair need also to heal and to rest. So I'm gonna do something very quick. I'm gonna reintroduce myself by telling you not the R, because it's curious in American vernacular English, British English, makes no distinction between an, an R and the B. When Black folk, when we ask someone, there's always two central questions for every Black child. We grow up with this. Who you be? We are not asking who you are. We're asking for the essence of who you be. And B, this question of who you be, Shakespeare's to be or not to be, is transient. It is relational. It is who I am right now, who I was, so I am, and so I would say, I be being a professor because what's on my CV is, yes, my accomplishments, I got a PhD, but having a PhD is not being a professor. Being a professor is doing what I'm doing right now. It's engaging with you. It is always in constant motion. It is a practice of time and relation. And then our second question that I always ask, ever since I was a child, is who are your people? Who are your people also requires you, and is a, these are questions about situating and locating. How do you locate yourself in a history and a lineage of the people? Where, not where are you from, like what city do you live in? I live in Rancho Cucamonga, I do. But who are my people? So in this like vein of situating and also um, um, recentering and demonstrating, and also in, in the, the tradition of, of standpoint feminists like Patricia Hill Collins, who charge us with situating ourselves with respect to our knowledge, our research, and what we're doing and why we do what we do, I'm going to kind of reframe this. So my people are, I come from a long lineage of Virginian African Americans. My family, my father's family helped establish one of the first free towns um, in Ruthville, Virginia. It existed before the Civil War. My tra I track my lineage on my father's side of the family back to the 1619 slaves that were brought here um, to work in the United States and many of whom were freed or worked their way because at that time you could work your way, work their way, um, Abram Brown being one, to freedom and establish the town right on the shores and right on the banks of Charles City. I also come from a strong line on my mother's side of women who have worked, who have worked as maids, as laborers, as professors. My mother was an executive at IBM who have worked and worked their way from, my mother grew up very poor and worked their way through education and a lot of opportunity. My mother became an executive at IBM because IBM had enacted for a very short period of time an affirmative action program. Prior to that, my mother and my father had split up. My mother was unemployed and my mother was on welfare. 
she took a test at the Urban League that was um, administered or, or um, not, it was administered by the Urban League, but it was for IBM. She scored very high on the test. They were like, wow, you scored the highest on the test. And anybody who's taken it here at the North Philadelphia Urban League. And they invited her into first the secretarial pool. Then she moved from the secretarial pool to systems engineer pool. And then she ended up in the executive pool. But the reason why I track that in my lineage and who my people, she's my people, but in her story and in what she did is an opportunity that does not exist very much anymore. And so I locate myself personally within that lineage. I have shown you some of where I locate myself as a scholar. I'm a black feminist scholar. I study political science. I study sociology. I study patterns of speech, linguistics, and behavior. But in the end, I am studying it with a viewpoint of black feminist theory and black feminist scholarship. And I've told you a lot about who I be. I have told you more than I would normally say in any kind of talk like this as a parent, as a mother, as a person who's struggling in this moment. But this is what the situating and the locating and the recentering is. Because in this, according to Black feminist scholarship, is our truth, right? In this, it will tell you a lot about how I affiliate myself and why I make the choices I make and why I'm spending the time the way that I'm spending my time. Um, I do a lot of research and a lot of work with doctors. And one of the things that my research has revealed is that part of the problem and the disconnect, and I'm doing it with black women, but this goes with parents of children who have mental illness, to people who have serious health conditions is that doctors don't tell you anything about who they be. They walk into the room and they're doctors. But what does that tell you about the doctor as a healer, as an advocate, as a prescriber, as a person who's there to walk you through a health journey? Nothing. So part of the work that we do is to work on building what is called, and here's my second fancy word, a hermeneutic bridge, a bridge between the doctor's experience and the person in the room. And part of that hermeneutic bridge, part of that recentering, right? Because the doctor walks in, the doctor is the center. And as the center, you're always supposed to know who they are and who their people are. My people went, I'm, my people are Harvard University, and that's not a people. And so part of that recentering and reframing is to build the hermeneutic bridge between what was once the center to the margin. And part of what you do with that, and this is from Black vernacular speech and African American community culture, is to tell people who you be. And then I can ask you who your people are. I can go in more to the linguistics about that um, if you'd like. So I'm going to leave you with this quote on a dialectics, and this is a dialectic of reframing. Um, Bibet Gurick says that Black people have always been looked down upon for speaking their dialect because it's a convenient marker of position in society. And it is one of our markers in position in society, but it's also a way of condemning their dialect or condemning our dialect as a tool of repression. When you take away a person's speech and you take away the way that people can describe experience, being instead of are, right? Then you take away my ability to build that hermeneutic bridge. You take away the ability of me to describe to you what it feels like. And the video I was gonna show you is mothers who have lost their children to um, police violence, who are sending a, a, a video note to Brianna Taylor's mother. They are trying to describe to her not only that they're her people now, but what it is like, what it be like to be where they are and that they understand it and that they are there for her. When you take away my language, then all I'm left with are statistics, variables and other sorts of things to try to draw a hermeneutic bridge 
or an experience and justify something that, as I said at the beginning, should never have to be justified. And that is my existence and my ability to live here in peace and in joy. So I'm going to stop it um, for questions, if there are any questions or reactions. Um, I, so, so I, um, I can't see, so can we stop the screen share? Cause I, Oh yeah, I'm going to stop the screen share. And, you know, I usually on these moments, I will ask you, it, you know, you can tell me anything. Let me get to screen share, stop screen share. Um, okay. So now, now I can see everybody, okay. which is a little more, uh, so I can see if anyone is raising their hand or, yes. uh, wants to, to ask something in the chat. I think, um, and I'll, if I, if there are a couple, I have a ton of questions, but I, I don't want to talk, maybe I'll start because it doesn't seem as if, oh, Aiden has a question. So let me just unmute Aiden and let, um, let, go ahead and can you. Uh, Hi there. Can you hear okay. me? Yeah, go ahead, Aiden. All right, cool. Um, so I guess I was just, uh, first off, thank you for talking to us today. Um, but uh, second, I was just a bit curious about um, you talking about the oppression of like your language. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm so sorry. That's okay. I need to evacuate. Uh, I'm safe. so sorry. Uh, what, can you ask your question and then we'll, I'll play it back for you. Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, so just my question was when you were talking about the, um, the oppression of like, language, I guess I was asking for like, examples of how you see it being oppressed. Because I guess how I look at it is that, you know, we all grow up in kind of um, a common core education like system. Um, and I guess yes, we, we kind of lean towards like a certain way of speaking. Uh, and I don't see that as a bad thing, but I guess I'm just curious about like the oppression of language that you were talking about. Well, what I'm talking about, and I'm sorry if you have to leave. I mean, it's take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, so, and be safe, y'all. Um, so what I'm talking about is, and I'm glad you brought up Common Core, right? Because Common Core. Um, linguists call prestige English and prestige English is the English that you have to engage in in order to to kind of do the work. I had to learn a language and learn um, a way of speaking. Um, that's what that's why y'all are here. Right. Because if you study political science and you study it in graduate school, you have to then start to learn how to speak like a political scientist. You study feminist epistemology. You have to learn that language. So what I'm talking about specifically is the ways in which knowledge and truth verification. So there's one thing to, to engage in prestige English, right? And say that this is what I have to do in a job interview. But it is another thing to have the way in which you describe your experience and the language and the words that you were used to describe that experience to be um, stigmatized, to be condemned, to be rebuked, to be said, you know, I, I you know, I used to talk about this with Bill Cosby, but you know, now everybody hates Bill Cosby. So <laughs> I guess it's easier now. Um, but Bill Cosby used to have the shtick about, you know, uh, uh, seeing black men on the corner in North Philly and he couldn't understand what they were saying because it's all about the y'alls and yous and blah, blah, blah. And I can't understand any of that. And that's not English. See, when you say something is not English, and this is not the way to talk. That's what I mean about denigrating and violently removing this way of speaking. And so while I can engage in prestige English and I can engage in vernacular English, and also I'm very versant, by the way, in mental health theory because I'm a mental health advocate, I should not have to if I'm in the doctor's office and I am in pain and I am trying to relate to you the nature of the pain that I'm in or I'm in the midst of, in the community and the, the groups of women that I work with, complete family breakdown because I have a child who is behaving in ways that nobody understands. Now I have to, what I call cultural labor, and I could have given a whole presentation of that. Now I have to translate my pain and my experience, not only into prestige English, but to build the bridge between the person who is supposed to be helping me and supposed to understand so that they can understand it. So this is a, a you know, quadruple level of translation that often means that people do individual violence or they just shut up. They don't get what they need. 
So that's what I'm more talking about. And the reason why I'm bringing in vernacular into this setting with you all is because if you're not hearing the vernacular, you don't understand the various ways in which people communicate. And you are taught that there's a proper way to speak. And it does, I read medical diaries a lot and social worker diaries, and they do say this, the mother can't speak properly. This is why the child is having a problem. So this is what I'm talking about. This is, this is not right. The mother can't speak properly for what? She's probably speaking properly to convey what speech is meant to convey, which is the truth of her experience. What it should read, and I've corrected it, is I can't understand, I'm not versant in the community that I have chosen to do my work in. And then I usually just say to people, now you gotta do some work. So that's what I mean by prestige, like violently and removing and looking down upon certain dialects. Um, I'm not saying that when, when a group of doctors come together and they're talking about a hematoma, that now they have to start slipping into black vernacular English. Yeah, I mean, I was just listening to an NPR piece the other day. It was written by a linguist, and she was talking about how they have real world data on how dialects or even accents are interpreted, and um, that people, when they don't like a dialect, can even shut down and stop mm -hmm. listening and make assessments of uh, intelligence level. And, you know, you and I come from Philadelphia, and you know, there's a working class white Philadelphia accent, right? Yes. Uh, and it's and it's uh, or Boston. You could think of Boston as well. Um, and I, it, I mean, it, you're saying something really fascinating that I kind of have to process a little bit because um, language, like we study foreign language, right? And we give it credence because language um, is not only rooted in material reality, but there are different assumptions built into the descriptions of language, different ways of viewing the world. Yeah. And, and it seems to me that what you're saying, like embedded in this dialectic is a different way of viewing the world. It's a worthy way of viewing the world. And um, it, it also leads not only to, you know, all of the epistemic consequences that you're talking about, recentering, which I also want to get to the other component that I thought was really fascinating when you talked about healing, right? Like that's not embedded in a lot of epistemic language. You know, you know, you know, so that's that's really sort of a unique contribution right there. And it speaks to what we need to get beyond. Right. Mm -hmm. Which we, my students in race and political thought have read Kendi. It was like a starting out point. Um, and now we're reading Baldwin and um, they have not only different understandings of political change, but different visions of what that might look like. And it seems to me so far Baldwin is the one who most richly talks about the potential for healing. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just, uh, to me, this is a whole new epistemic theory, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. in, in some ways, you know. And so I, I wonder if, and I, I'll, I, I, there are many questions I want to ask, but maybe I'll just start with this one because it's rooted in what we've been reading in race and political theory. And that is, uh, I wonder if you could talk more about, um, the potential for change, how you see the potential change in this, uh, the, the mechanisms for change in this theory. Because it, it, you're, you're really, you're, you know, you, you can talk about it in terms of, uh, you know, highfalutin epistemic theory, but really, really in the end, it's a theory that gets us to political change. Right. And how you see that and what you think that looks like. And in particular, if you could elaborate a little bit about what I find most interesting is the healing component. Because I don't, I just, I don't, I, I haven't heard that anyplace else. So um, well, feel free to answer none of it or all of it or, or whatever so, you want. So, so, okay, so, and maybe it'll get at like some of the language things. So first of all, in, in terms of, um, you know, a lot of what I'm doing and a lot of the work that that we're engaged in, particularly um, at, well across both of, of the organizations that that I sit and and I help develop, is um, not only this sort of recentering and and this repositioning. Um, and this is a lot of this healing stuff, by the way. I I would say first, um, look at the work of Kara Walker, right? Um, and and um, 
there and look at the work there's there's a wonderful organization that that I work with kind of on and off um it's called uh black it's being black emotional and mental health justice so they are and they are doing remarkable theorizing and work so a lot of this work in terms of healing and I like what you are epistemologies of healing because I haven't seen that and I might steal it if that's okay I'll cite you but um, <laughs> because a, a, a lot of this work is happening amongst activists right and so I have um, had the privilege for the last 10 years to, to straddle um, and, and the academic world and spend a lot of time in, in the activist world. So when I started working with activists and I started, you know, and I went in quite honestly, like the typical, like a uh, uh, PhD in political science, like, okay, here's the variables. We're gonna, you know, I'll do the interviews and I'll let you know what goes on. And, and with the five voice research, you know, I, I had this wonderful wealth of data and I also did some stuff on C-section and black maternal um, child mortality. And one day I was given a presentation or one workshop and a woman said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of this. This is bullshit. Cause I already know we die. I don't need you to collect the data and then come back and give it to me and say, Hey, look, you die at higher proportions. And she was like, who are you trying to prove this to? Cause I don't need the proof. She says, what I need is something different. What I want to know is how to live. And what I want to know is how to heal from this. How do I conceptualize and how do I start to understand that? And I was like, I felt like this big. And um, it took me like three years of, of really starting to work, which led me to doing um, just by happenstance, because not to name check uh, a, a member of our committee, uh, Dr. Eckert and I share um, a academic lineage with Linda Alcoff. So I was looking at some stuff like from her and I kind of hit her up on Twitter. And she's like, oh, look at that. And and I mean, everybody, I do that too. You talk to your graduate students, your former grad, and we're still always here. I'm always going to be like 20 when I talk to her. And so I went to a podcast and I found, not with her, but I found Christy Dodson. And Christy Dodson is an African-American philosopher and she is doing this work and she used this term that I never heard before of epistemic oppression. And I was like, epistemic oppression, this is like, and I listened to it and I, and I think I must have listened to it like three times. I signed it, I had my students break it down and then I started reading her stuff on epistemic oppression. And basically what she's saying about epistemic oppression, all the things that I've been talking about, language, when you, when the language that you use to describe your experience, your language that you use to verify your truth, the metrics that you use to verify truth, and whether or not something is untrue, when all of these things are not simply not looked at, but the person that you're talking to, right, the institution that you're appealing to has actively restricted and denied your ability to use that language. She calls this, a, this is a form of epistemic oppression. This oppresses my ability to relate the truth that I live and to do the things that I need to you. And so, I started connecting this. So it's her work, Fricker's work, um, uh, Miranda Fricker's work on, um, and she's really the, the big one on testimonial injustice. So testimonial injustice is when I tell you what is going on when I go to the doctor's office. And, and I deal a lot with this when I talk to social workers and somebody, a uh, parent's like, well, what happened? And the parent tells you what happened. And she says why it happened. And you go, that doesn't, you know, first of all, it doesn't fit the form. And that happens a lot with parents of children who have an illness. It's like, well, that's, there's nowhere on this form that I, I it's either got to be ADHD or bipolar. Which one is it? It's like, well, it's both. And I think it's a little bit of autism. Well, uh, we're just going to call it autism. And this happens, this kind, and this is a form of injustice that Fricker says, right? Because now you have constructed a person's experience and you have constructed a person's identity. And in very real ways, in a medical community, you have defined the path that this person must go through for healing and you have misappropriated and misassigned it. Um, and that's a really awkward one. I have better examples of this, of testimonial injustice. So this whole group of scholars, Fricker, Dodson, um, Jose Medina are looking at these epistemologies of oppression and 
now this is what led me to looking at healing right so if i'm if we can start to describe the conditions under which people are psychically right their truth is being obstructed is being oppressed and being denied then and now you get the political science in to me right then i like then you know because political scientists are shoddy engineers in my mind. Like we just like sit around and we're like reverse engineering other people's theories. And I was like, then there has to be some sort of pathway to address what this woman asked me to address two years prior. How do I heal from this? And the entire project, by the way, of Mothers on the Front Line is to address this and pathways to healing. So one of the pathways to healing we talk about is narrative justice. Narrative justice is part of this healing movement giving people the opportunity and sitting back and listening to tell their story and to share their experience, not to contextualize it through a bunch of questions, not to containerize it, but you tell me what you think is most important for me to know about the experience, and this goes back to the Say, Our Name, Say Her Name video, about the experience of being a mother who lost a child to police violence, because I haven't, thank goodness, many people haven't, and so for me to contextualize it and believe that I have the right question to access the meaning of your experience is a form of epistemic privilege. So you hand that privilege over. You tell me what you need to know. I liken it closely to grounded theory. So this is part of healing um, because healing is in trauma. What happens to people in trauma is that you lose your ability to frame your experience. You lose your ability. You become unmoored in a way that you cannot, I don't even have words. This is why people shut down. This is why trauma starts to be experienced in people's bodies. This is what we mean by trigger, right? A trigger is, I think I'm okay. And then I walk and I look this and I break down. And now I don't know why I broke down. And so part of narrative justice and healing and narrative is to get people to reclaim that experience, name what is happening to them, have some sort of agency in defining it, and then further agency in creating this narrow, in creating a pathway to truth from it, right? Um, and then my job, and what I say to my graduate students who are doing this work is your job is to not only honor that, but then contextualize it and not defile it by telling and deciding that this is the meaning. It is more of interpretive. I don't know if I'm answering your question about sort of healing so um so that's been one component and there's a lot in in if you look at the 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 groups that that i talked about and there's a ton out there in in this movement called healing justice but the big thing in epistemic healing is the reclaiming of the narrative and it's a long process it's a lot of workshops it's a lot of, of journaling quite honestly and we've worked with counselors and we, I have talked to people in counseling modalities of just how you get people to name experience, right? Because many people who have experienced trauma, women in particular, people who have experienced loss, Black people, we've had our experience named for us. And there is a power in bringing that. And Baldwin talks a little bit about this in naming and bringing that through fruition by telling, right? Well, I mean, what's so interesting, too, is that narrative, especially in political science, is quote unquote anecdotal. Yeah, that's why I got kicked out. <laughs> right. so, so the very thing and it's rooted in 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 linguistics and social location and all things you're talking about. And it's a uh, it's it's constitutes epistemic oppression because it's a way of saying, well, this your narrative and particularly the way you're speaking about it is invalid. Well, and narrative is. Yeah. It's anecdotal, let's be quite frank, because the people who are coding, the people who are doing the listening don't understand what's being said. And they don't have the skill sets and they don't have the experience to interpret. This is what Hill Collins talks about with social construction of Black feminist thought. And, you know, my students every year, they're like, oh, she, is she saying that only Black women can verify truth with other Black women? So only Black women can do research on Black women? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, what she's saying is if you don't have... You, and Fricker talks about this, and the whole epistemic injustice philosoph uh, philosophers talk about this. We only have a certain 
very finite way of verifying things, right? So what methods are is a language. It's a language. And, and you learn it. You learn quantitative methods. You learn independent variable. You learn dependent. And then you learn how to interpret. It gives you the interpretive framework to verify what's happening and what's not happening. So when political scientists, when I hear somebody say it's anecdotal, all I hear is somebody who does not understand <laughs> and does not have the skill sets to and the proper interpretive framework to interpret what's being said. And the supremacy of it and the arrogance of it is that you get to decide that it is anecdotal, therefore less important and not the other way around. If we flip the world, and we were in a different place, statistics would be anecdotal. Right. Like, I don't. Right. And then if the you end, talk to my aunt, they are, because she's like, I don't know where those numbers came. That could be magic numbers. I don't know how. What am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. Yeah. Do we, do we, have, do we have questions? I know some of the, my students, um, particularly in capping, are trying to figure out the some of the issues that you're talking about in terms of how do I operationalize and so and so many so many times especially in political science like the sorts of questions you want to ask particularly about social justice um, don't lend themselves to to the traditional methods like don't lend themselves to statistics you're not going to get you're not going to get the answer you need right to the question you're asking and in fact your question is going to have to change so that it fits with the method rather than the question driving the method, right? So I, I have some students right now in cap and gapping who are dealing with something similar, like how do I, I want to use narrative, I want to use discourse, I want to say that's my data, right? Mm -hmm. Grapple, grappling with how to operationalize and you're actually providing a kind of epistemic framework for them to operationalize and ask the social justice questions that they want to ask because these sorts of questions and also what's interesting too is you're connecting, you know, Coates says this, right? Coates says that we can talk about racism and all of these sorts of ways, you know, statistical, sociological concepts on and on and on institutions. But he says there's a toll on the body and mm -hmm. it's, it's visceral. And I think what you're, you're, you're kind of giving voice to is that and providing a framework in which to move forward and to talk about these issues, it's to say, Yes, it's all those things, but it's also a visceral um, experience on the body that produces um, produces trauma mm -hmm. and shapes subjectivity and shapes the subject citizen in a democracy as we're trying to figure out how to participate and to generate political change. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, to me, oh, I think we have a question. We've got a question here from Her Herrick. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Or yeah, very well. All right. Um, so okay, this is kind of this might be a stupid question, but I feel like it's important to ask because with like um the current state of things, and you know, you mentioned you're a mother, you're a daughter, you're a friend. Uh, I just want to know like how you're doing throughout all this. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for that question. No, it's not a stupid question. It's actually, I mean, and that's funny because when we're talking about healing and doing research with people, that's the question I demand that my graduate students ask first. How are you? How are you doing? How is this? Is this okay? And is this the good time? So I, I, I thank you for that question. And I'm going to be quite honest with you. It, it varies. I mean, we, you know, my um, husband is is was Soviet raised, and um, it's very hard for him to kind of experience going through what we're going through because it replicates. If you come from a, a country in which you've had to live with fascism or totalitarianism, and you know how scary it can actually get, it's it's trauma inducing, and so for me, I, I between that and and you know. It, it's well known because our organization, Mothers on the Front Line, is founded by uh, mothers who have children who have mental health conditions. So I have my stepson is has you know he's on the spectrum and he has struggles with depression. He's your you guys' age, and so what I find myself doing is really trying to walk this tightrope of really like signifying that things are going to be okay and it's normal and we're going to, we try to do things that are, are, are enriching and nourishing 
and and not try to tear each other up. We're six people in in a townhouse, right? We all have rooms, but we're not. We don't have like land and a bunch of other things to kind of. And we can't go outside anyway. Respite. And so I deal with. I don't typically have anxiety, but I'm dealing with a lot of anxiety. Um, and and quite frankly, I spend a lot of time early meditating and trying to breathe and and really practice. Some of the things that um, I've learned with the community groups that I work with, I spent a great deal of time early on with COVID on two task force, COVID task force with um, RJ task force. And we really were put together legislation that then we passed on to Pelosi and I was exhausted. I mean, I was just mentally and I threw my back out and I wasn't even, usually I do that if I'm working out. Um, and so I feel it, my body feels heavy and I'm just trying to name it, but thank you so much for that question. I mean, that, that, that's the essence of the questions that particularly, um, for my students and anybody who does research with me and my research team, I'm doing research with communities that either are experiencing trauma or who have histories of trauma. And one of the things that we talk about, and this comes from knowing political science, a survey can be such a nasty thing to a person who has experienced deep and profound trauma. And so I just had a student who um, wonderfully, her research and everything, she's Nigerian, was pulled in, um, and it's now that she's helping to, to inform a UN study, but her work was with the Chibok women. And she was working for an NGO and they're like, well, can you do a survey? And she came to me and she's like, professor, I can't go in and just ask. So when you were kidnapped and for seven years, like, you know, what was it? Did, you, did this happen? Did this happen? And so I helped her design what we call a trauma-informed survey, a trauma, trauma-informed research methods. And one of the cornerstones of any type of trauma-informed work is to ask the question you asked, Herrick, how are you doing? How are you doing right now? And I always ask, how are you being? So not even how are you doing at this moment, but how are you being in time? All right, yeah, thank you. I mean, that was actually a great question because it integrate everything, integrated everything you're talking about um, in, in some really beautiful way, nice, eloquent way at the end. I, I don't, Deanne, I, I, I just want to recognize that it's, it's um, 2.15 and I could spend till five o'clock with you, but I, but I don't, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, uh, take, take your time. I have a little bit more time. I mean, it's, it's quiet now and it's 11.17 um, and it's Saturday. <laughs> So, so your teenagers haven't woken up yet. No, they haven't woken up. And my 10 year old is like, oh my God, I get to sit here. I'm going to watch Pokemon. And she's really gonna bother me. So this is like, yeah. see, that's parenting at its best right there. Yeah. yeah that's what, that's is, what mine is, are doing. Yeah. He brought me tea. He's like, he set me up. He's like, there's no reason for you to move. It's two hours. Do, do you have any, do you, I, I mean, I think you can see Dr. Benson Smith is totally open to answering any questions and won't make you feel foolish. Are there any other questions that you're thinking and you are thinking to yourself, well, I don't quite have it formulated, but I really want to ask. Dr. Benson Smith is, she's not like this with me personally, but with, with students, she's very, <laughs> very at ease. Yes, yeah, so I'm at ease with with very Dr. kind. I it's should, just we go back. Too I should far. say kind. Yeah, yes, I, we're, we, we <laughs> he's blunt with me. Let me put it that yes, way. Yes, it's like it, <laughs> when you talk about when I talk about my academic people and I talk about, you know, the relationships that that the true relationships that formed me. Dr. Eckert is is, you know, interstitched in my entire experience. Um, in, in graduate school and definitely, I mean, I don't think you know this because I don't even think I told you this because I mean, when she, when she started graduate school, I was studying Congress and my attitude was that I didn't want to have anything to do with, with race. I was like, you know, I, I resented the fact that, you know, professors were like, hey, do you, they would always ask me something. It was always like the race question. I was like, I'm going to do Congress and I'm going to prove what I can do with Congress. And I actually was writing a pretty good dissertation on Congress and it was getting a lot of recognition. And um, 
I think we went to a conference or something like that because she did, Dr. Eckert is one of the few people that I am okay with sharing a room with, like being that kind of, of open. And so I was miserable. And she's like, you're miserable. <laughs> I am. I'm miserable. And I remember, because we talked about, remember I said like khaki sickness, like I'm going to sit on this con and, and I'm like, I'm going to die. I'm going to be here. It's just going to be bald white men with like Harry Potter. Well, not at that time, <laughs> Harry Potter and khaki and looking at me like, yeah. And so she's like, well, just life is too short. You do what you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> and and sometimes people say something to you and they say it to you. And, and, you know, it was a longer conversation. It was a very pinpointed conversation. And I went home and she was, and I was like, you know, she's right. Um, what do I want to write about? And, and I really wanted to write about African-American women and black women and constructions of black women in welfare policy. And I managed to write this dissertation that really when I look at it and I'm on dissertation committees, I'm actually kind of shocked that I got to write it. Um, <laughs> and it's not really political science, it's more political sociology, but it definitely is what led me to doing the work that I'm doing now. Um, so, so she had a really big, having an honest, like sometimes painfully honest, friend is especially if you're going through this kind of process i think yeah. just you know important invaluable and i'll just say that the feeling is mutual i about the entire race and political thought syllabus is really from our conversations so i'm so jealous that you get to teach that that was I like know. my dream class i taught I it once and then i our, there was a whole department of redesign and i woke up there like now you're in uh applied gender <laughs> study and that's <laughs> professor moore's class now so and i resent him because he could talk about baldwin but he resents me because i teach about audrey lord so i guess it's a well you know we should hire you that's that would be that would be the thing to do but it's cold it's and I'm, <laughs> I'm not acclimated to the cold anymore it's true i mean i don't know how you can say that after being in syracuse but We'll let, we'll have that different conversation offline because that was <laughs> just being in Syracuse alone is hellish. Yes. Um, do, do you guys, and by the way, some of my students right now are in California. They're zooming in and they're, oh, they're wow. in the LA area. I, I see what one. What park? Put it in the comma. Like we're at in the LA area. I'm in Rancho Cucamonga. Shout out to the Inland Empire. Um. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> Andrew, ha Andrew has a question. Um, wait, hang on. I, I, I'm the worst TA ever, Dion. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, of all, I just want to say I got some family in Portland, Oregon, so I, I've okay. been hearing wild stuff about the, those fires. But yeah. the question I wanted to ask is, uh, in class, we've sort of talked about the difference between these sort of anti-racist arguments and this assimilation art, mm -hmm. assimilationist arguments that these people who think they're fighting for equality, but at the same time, they're sort of demanding the uh, destruction of this black culture that is obviously very valuable. So my question for you is when it comes to vernacular, would, would an anti-racist view of this be an integration of these two different vernaculars or would it be just the coexistence? Well, I, it, you know, I think that I, I think a code, I'm going to argue for coexistence and, and, and I argue for coexistence because one of the things that I didn't talk about, but I did I, when I was speaking yesterday at Cornell College is the, the vernacular, and we talked about this a little bit today, that the purpose of language is to really access and describe experience. And one of the powerful things about the phrase, how you be, or I be, you know, I be, um, can mean a lot of different things in African American vernacular English. Uh, B, the way we use B, could mean habitual. So there was a, a, a study um, at Johns Hopkins where they had, um, they put like a couple African, they had um, African American kids look at two pictures. One was a picture of, of Elmo, and Elmo was eating a cookie. And the other picture was a soup, um, cookie monster just sort of looking at Elmo eat the cookie. And they asked, who be eating the cookies? And the kids said, cookie monster. Because while Elmo is in the state of eating the cookie, 
right at that moment, a cookie, we all know the cookie monster be always eating cookies, right? So even if you cookie monster wasn't eating a cookie in that per frame, the kids knew from watching Sesame Street that in the second frame, Cookie Monster was going to be eating the cookies. And Cookie Monster probably ate some cookies before he sat down. And Cookie Monster will be eating cookies again. So B in that derivation means something habitual. But B in who you be, depending on how it's asked, is either an invitation, like who you be. And you walk in, like if I walked out right now and I, my mother saw me and I'm dressed up because I'm usually like in pajamas or sweats, she goes, girl, who you be? So means I'm being a professor and you can see I'm being a professor because I'm dressed like it and I'm ready to be that. And the reason why I'm saying I'm arguing for existence, and that's just like one of like several examples I gave, is that what Black vernacular English does is it reveals not only continuity and transition and relationships in being. And think about it, if you're studying intersectionality, the whole existence of this entire subfield within you know, feminist thought, but has now become like crossed over into all other areas of, of the academy, is to try to describe a interrelational transitory state that exists in one person, right? So I am black, I am female, I am this, I am that, I am all of these, and all of these are mutually constitutive of who I be. And so the way that standard American vernacular English and prestige English has no way to access that. This is why we spend so much time trying to describe one and three and interlocking and everything else because right. we don't have a phrase of being. You are or you are not. Right. You are not in being. And so I think in existing next to one another, and this is what I meant. I, I mean, obviously, and I, my kids learn standard English. My kids also learn vernacular English. My kids also know Rushklish, which is like something that's some sort of bizarre thing that comes from having a non-Russian speaking parent and a Russian speaking parent. And then they start, and so there's all these words that are kind of these kooky words that translate like uh, brat is actually brother in Russian. So that's like one of their favorite ones. My daughter calls her brother's brats. Where's the brat? Where's the big brat? Where's the little brat? Um, and so language in accessing this kind of experience needs to, because it lives and it breathes and experience is transient and it's always being, you know, um, um, created. I think I'm not going to ever argue for a, a assimilation of this. Um, and I think it's okay to be kind of multi-dialectical. Right. I don't know if I answered your question. You totally did. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, you, uh, a Andrew, we've been, you know, we've been starting with uh, Kendi and Kendi has these three categories that he says reappear throughout history. It's the segregationist, the assimilationist and the anti-racist. And, uh, and it seems- But he slightly lacks a feminist, a black feminist lens too. And that's like, my <laughs> wait, wait, say that, say that again. You I said he's like, he's also, again, you know, I like his work, but it also can use a bit more of yeah. a black feminist lens. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, there's wonderful movements. The reproductive justice movement is an integrative movement that is again, relational, um, in, in how it articulates its, its view of racial justice and, and class justice. Yeah, I mean, I think that was really important to say. I'm glad you said that. He he does he does he does you know kind of reference, you know, he talks about uh, queer racism and um, sexist racism. So he does give a nod to intersectionality, but it doesn't linger on it. And in many ways, like he kind of reminds me of Manning Marital, Marital because there's a it it race is so entwined with um, with capitalism and. Mm -hmm you know, and a material sort of dialectic um, that, and I, you know, we're in race and political thought, we didn't really raise those issues. I just sort of said there are ways to critique them, um, but we, so I'm really glad that you, you pointed that out. Um, are, are there, are there other questions? I, I just want to say too, that your point about, um, you know, uh, you know, language and the, 
ability uh, to hold contradictory and, 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 and a, a, a number of different states seems to me to take the insights from intersectionality to a whole new epistemic level, which I think mm -hmm. is really fascinating. Ads, I think, will help us a lot when we get to the end of the syllabus and race and political thought and start to talk about intersectionality. So I'm really thankful for that. All right, I mean, Herrick has another question. Um, go, go ahead, Herrick. Um, yeah, it's not really so much of a question. It's like more like a comment on the whole, like, I just think like, no, not just think, I feel like um, everything we've been talking about, like about linguistic impression, like it really like resonates with me. Like, um, obviously I don't share the same experience, but um, I could, as a person of color, I could definitely like empathize. Um, I grew up uh, in a Guyanese family. And for those who don't know that Guyanese people, we speak English. Um, but like as a kid, I was, I had like a really like thick Guyanese accent because my parents were always working. I was like raised with my extended family and yeah, basically I almost got like held back because like, I, um, I had to be in like speech class for like a while until like I learned how to talk like everyone else pretty much. And at the time I remember like being like really stressed and like, I don't know, I kind of like hated like my accent and like it was bad. And I mean, uh, my parents had to like start like talking like more like, like, uh, like everyone, like, like, um, how they talk, like at work around me. And it was like, it, it was an experience like growing up, like, um, obviously now I feel like I don't really have that accent, but, um, yeah, that was just like, that's just my experience on the situation. Yeah. And accent to speech is, is, you know, like, it's funny because, you know, people will say something like, to my kids like oh your father's accent is really cool and then they don't even hear like a lot of the accent at speech that his accents but then they also have his speech patterns so like um my my husband says today morning right so how are you doing today morning it's not this morning and so this is what my kids just say today morning right or they'll like um medicine he'll go eat your pills and so, you know, and I go, did you take your medicine? I didn't eat my medicine this morning. I got to eat my medicine. And so these linguistic patterns of, of how people access and, and, and really describe to me are, are, it's also part of the richness, right? Um, and, you know, he comes from an empire too. I mean, he, he is ethnically Russian and it's an empire and it imposes speech. And, and politically, as, and we don't even talk about this as political scientists, but the whole purpose of the imposition of speech for an empire is to make the administration of the empire easier for the, you know, for those that are in the center, right? And so the reason why Russian is imposed, and this is the official language of the empire, is that the official business now happens in that. But there's like hundreds of different dialects and he's from St. Petersburg, there's a Muscovite um, accent. And so accented speech, um, I don't know what point in time in the United States, we all became Iowan, right? Like, because that was like the, the thing um, was that you wanted your newscasters to have the blandest accent. And they thought that the blandest accent with the least amount of North Philadelphia speech pattern, no Boston use, that's for sure, uh, was Iowa. And that largely became a standard um, for how you hear what is proper and what is unaccented speech, right? Um, so even with the Guyanese accent, it's still English, it's accented speech. I mean, I, I again, Professor Eckert and I grew up in Philly and there's, there's some heavily accented you get into some parts of South Philadelphia and it's, it's, it's pretty deep accents. And even for me, when I moved and away and I was going through all sort of the press junkets and things like that for, um, for basketball, I remember my coach who was from Indiana saying that he, I had to quit saying duh. So they were working on me to get rid of my North Philadelphia accent. Um, water, like don't say water, it's water, um, that kind of thing. I still say water. So you know what, so do I. I try not to, but every once in a while it slips out. Yes. And then my kids are like, and they also make fun of the way I say cow. Oh, my kids make fun too. And the way I say mayonnaise, <laughs> they're like, it's not man eggs. <laughs> it's, 
mayonnaise. <laughs> they yeah. make fun of it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting too, from, you know, Herrick's Her com commentary and from what you've been saying as well, is that you internalize that. You know, you internalize what the dominant culture says um, about the way you speak instead of the dominant culture taking the hermeneutic leap and having some hermeneutic generosity to figure out what the world is like from your perspective and what is the assumptions that are embedded your, in your language. That's part of the oppression. Mm -hmm. like part of the oppression is to get you to think, and that's, that's the worst form of oppression, right? That's the, one yeah. of the worst aspects of it when they get you to think uh, what they think about you. That uh, uh, Medina calls it hermeneutic death. Yeah, yeah. And as someone who studies law, you know, all of the best cases, and there aren't many of them, but all of the best cases that, that, that attempt to redress discrimination, the justices are taking a hermeneutic leap. Mm -hmm. um, and so that hermeneutic leap is just so enormously impor important, especially you would think when it comes to interpreting language. Yeah. Which is a dimension that... We're at the 235 mark. Okay. I know, I, know, I know that there are questions that some people are hesitant to ask. So maybe I'll get them to, um, to talk in class and um, yeah. maybe I can funnel them to you. Um, I have a lot of, uh, some people, we're having this thing where we have Saturday classes. And so I scheduled you do, during our free period, but some people had to rush off to class at two. So I have a lot of comments here in the chat thanking you for taking the time to really give us this, you know, this is a rarefied opportunity for us. We're hearing from a graduate school professor who's actively, you know, that might not seem like a, a big deal to you, but this is, you know, someone who you'd be seeing in a graduate school class and who'd be teaching you method and taking you through, you know, the ropes. And, if it uh, helps, when I teach this with my graduate students, like I, I have a, um, a TA who is running sidecar with me because I'm teaching methods this semester. <laughs> He's like, okay, we're about to get to that part this semester. Are you going to start to question <laughs> why you're here? But she's really cool. It's going to be hard. And you're going to be sad because <laughs> they're getting to the part where they actually have to answer who you be and why are you yeah. asking? Like, yeah. what are you really asking people to do? And they have to keep these really uh, uh, extensive uh research journals yeah. and there I have them and then they'll go and most of the class will defend their um, proposal. So they're writing, they're writing their proposal as they take this class, which we probably should rethink that sequence because it causes <laughs> a lot. <laughs> if you're like, my dissertation's a fraud. <laughs> so. yeah, right. right. Well, I mean, it's so important too, because as some of you guys are thinking about going to graduate school and that's a long, long arduous process and you got to figure out what sustains you. And I think the who you be question is about what sustains you, yeah. you know, and linking yourself to past, present and future. In a and you have to find your people in graduate school. Yeah. Okay. If you don't find your people in graduate school, it's just you know, so I make them do workshops and, and kind of move around in my first, when they have the first years, because I'm like, you, you have, you're not going to survive it. And you really cannot, um, spend a lot of time with your professors in graduate school. It's it's, like, I mean, that, if that, if there's nothing else you take away from this, those of you are thinking about graduate school, wherever you go. And really, I think probably in the world too, don't you think yeah. this is probably true in business and whatever you do, you got, you got to, you got to find people who are going to sustain you yeah. and really tell you the truth, you know, and support you. Um, I, I, I our, and last, last, last opportunity to, and I, I, I Dr. Benson Smith will not, I promise you will not. I don't bite. I really don't. I mean, <laughs> actually, even my graduate students, I'm like, you know, I, I keep lots of tissues, candies and things like that because, you know, I'm like, <laughs> there's lots of crying that happens in graduate school. Yeah. And that's okay. And so I'm just it's, like, have the feeling. Um, it's really true. So, and, and there's nothing, I mean, seriously, I have a 20 year old who, yeah, it's like, you know, I know you're the professor of that, but you're not the professor of everything. So, um, and, you know, 17, 18, and then 10. And so I'm, I have a very thick skin. Um, children, <laughs> comes, children keep you humble. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. 
you well, name it. I, I, I think we, we will come to a close. And okay. if, it's, if it's okay, uh, if, I, if somebody has a question that they might have been, they're trying to formulate, um, maybe I could, I could pass that on to you. Okay, um, well, I'm around and thank you. And it was good to see you. And, you know, we have to talk some more. Um, I'd love to talk some more about what we're working on with, with hermeneutic and justice and um, get your, your thoughts. And that sounds just so very interesting. So let, let's, let's, ke let's catch up after this. Yeah. And, um, and, and again, Dion, thank you so much. For, you know, I, I know your, you're your life is beyond busy. So thank you so much for giving us like almost two hours today. It's been amazing and um, really exciting for me to hear what somebody on, is doing on the cutting edge of scholarship. So thank you so much. And you guys, thank you for hanging in there with us. You guys were fantastic. And um, let's talk about this when we get to class. There's so much to, to move through. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thanks for the people I could see and, you know, stay safe and be well, folks. Yes, you seriously yeah. stay safe in terms of the fires and stuff, Dion. <laughs> we will. We're inside. So. All right. Okay. So, so good to see you. Are you ready? Talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Dion. I'm gonna I'm gonna end it for all. I'm gonna just click it. <laughs>